And welcome back to Irish American Magazine. My name is Tom Degnan. Today we are very lucky to be joined by esteemed writer and journalist TJ English. He is here to talk about his entire career as well as his latest book, which is called Jazz and the Underworld, Dangerous Rhythms. TJ English, welcome back to Irish America Magazine. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure to be here. Uh, TJ, we're doing this on Zoom. We're crossing our fingers that the technology cooperates. And one reason we're doing it this way is because initially the virus made it hard or impossible to sort of meet up with people. And I just wanted to check in first and foremost, how did you and your loved ones do in terms of the virus? How's everyone holding up? Yeah, thanks for asking. Good. I mean, uh, pretty much everybody I know had it at one time or another. I had it myself way back at the beginning of the virus period. Um, ironically, it turned out to be a good thing for the writing of this book because there was really nothing else to do for a long stretch of time there. So I got a lot of writing done and actually turned this manuscript in six months early, which is unheard of for me. So um, somehow made the pandemic work for me in a way. That's a silver lining, I guess. Um, and yeah. just be, along the same lines, you, you made the choice in this new book, uh, you dedicate it to, to all the musicians in jazz club and presarios who kept the music alive during the great pandemic. You cover uh, over well over a century in this book. Why did you wanna put that up front though? Well, I live in the village, you know, Greenwich Village and I'm surrounded by a lot of great little jazz clubs and I've become a pretty steady patron of those clubs and I've become friendly with the owners of a couple of those clubs. So I had a firsthand view of what they went through to try to keep the clubs functioning. And it was kind of, I guess all small businesses were dealing with this. It was kind of a heroic effort to keep the clubs functional. For a while there, they, they went to streaming music from the club because they couldn't allow patrons in at all. It really looked like a, a number of those clubs weren't gonna make it and they somehow did make it. And I know for me personally, as a lover of the music and a patron of the clubs, uh, it, was, um, it was amazing to me that they kept it going. So I felt like they deserved that honor. And it is sort of historically connected. Jazz music has been with us for a hundred years and it's weathered all kinds of things, wars, economic downturns, musical trends, it's been, it's gone from being the most popular music in America to being, you know, very marginalized in terms of the commercial marketplace. But it's still with us. It's still thriving, and that's because of the because of the musicians mostly. We're going to take a deep dive into all of that, and that's mainly what your book is about. But first, let's let's hear a little bit of what, about your own personal background. Um, can you tell us a little uh, from a big Irish American family in Washington? Correct. Yes. And what do we know about the Irish American? What do we know about the Irish roots there? Where in Ireland? Uh, my Irish roots are Tipperary. English is a Tipperary name. Uh, um, some people might know Nikki English, the great uh, athlete and now coach uh, in Tipperary. Um, no, I'm not related to him, but it's a pretty common name there in Tipperary. So I may claim family association to him every now and then. Um, uh, Tipperary and Kerry, um, famine immigrants. Uh, my father's family came to Pennsylvania and, and started there. And uh, each generation took one big step west. My father was born in uh, East St. Louis, Illinois. And then he moved to Seattle area. And I was born out there. And the interesting thing is that the first thing I did when I came of age at the age of 18 or so, I headed back east, uh, back to the origins of the family journey. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me in Washington state, um, growing up Irish American in Washington state, it wasn't so much Irish located in neighborhoods, but it was very much Irish located within the Catholic school system. And so I went to Catholic grade school Catholic high school, even Catholic university, I guess I went to Catholic schools all the way through my formal education. And that's where, you know, you come across the occasional Irish brogue 
and uh, firsthand connections to the old country. A big family, correct? Yes, big family, five girls and five boys. And what was that like? Uh, it was rambunctious, you know, it was, um, you know, that saying it takes a village. Well, a family of that size is like a village unto itself. And um, I enjoyed uh, the ball games and always having enough kids ar around to put together a, a team to play basketball uh, or um, wiffle ball. But um, I got a little annoyed with it because every school I went to, I, I had a few brothers and sisters who were there before me. So I was always judged according to their, their reputations. So I got out of that area by the time I turned 18. I went off to college in Southern California and then shortly after graduating came to New York. You took, uh, and before, last question before we get into the, into the new book, you mm -hmm. took a, a somewhat indirect route to writing, and we'll get to that. But was there a moment? Was there a person? Was there a book that sort of pushed you in that direction and said, hey, this is something I either want to do or just look more into? I started early, you know, um, grade school, high school. I worked on the school newspaper. College, I worked on the school newspaper. I was always, it was almost like a, an apprenticeship from the teenage years, I was always writing. I don't think I could narrow it down to one person, but um, I got it in my blood at a pretty, pretty early age and started to get positive feedback from it. And you know, when you're a kid, you're kind of drawn to whatever it is you're getting positive feedback from. So the roots of it were, were early. Um, I think it probably comes from some Irish storytelling tradition, because I've always been drawn to the, the concept of narrative. Everything I write um, winds up being the telling of a story or stories within the story. Well, let's get into those. Uh, you have had thus far uh, a, an already very impressive career. Um, people might know you best by the Westies, but there's also uh, Where the Bodies Are Buried, Whitey's Payback, Havana Nocturne, and what may be the most authoritative book on Irish American organized crime, Patty Whacked. Um, I'm interested, and, and for the record, a, a quote that jumps out at me, Christian Science Monitor calls you uh, maybe America's top chronicler of organized crime. And I'm interested in the word underworld, and I'm interested in the world part of that phrase, because again, people might associate you with uh, the Westies, West Side of Manhattan, Southie, but if you look at your career, you're looking at Nationwide and Patty Whack. You're looking at yeah. Cuba in Havana yeah. Nocturne. Can you, is there a way for you to talk about how you decide on these projects? Do, do you go out with them in mind? Do they come to you? How do you sort of decide on which project is worth pursuing? Most projects come from a subject that I've been uh, following for a huge part of my life. So jazz, for instance, um, I kind of always had this idea for this book in my back pocket um, and waiting for the right time to do it. And a big part of that was my love for the music and being an aficionado of the music. And if you're a jazz aficionado, you're an aficionado of the culture and the history. It's all part of the pro process of, of receiving the music. You know, back in the day when we used to buy albums, vinyl, uh, buying an album was like buying an, uh, an encyclopedia, uh, the liner notes, all the information about the recording session and the musicians. Um, so it was an educational process. So I felt like I had been um, apprenticing for this subject for a long time. And that was true of all the others, Patty Whacked. Uh, maybe the Westies is different because that sort of came out of nowhere. But mostly I try to choose topics where I feel like I have a running start in terms of the research, something that I'm already sort of emotionally connected to. I would be remiss not to quickly ask you, take a quick detour here. Can you briefly talk about how this very magazine played an important role in sort of the start of your career, Irish America? Yes, it did. Yeah. Um, boy, that's going back to the beginnings of the magazine. I knew Neil O'Dowd and Trish Hardy from San Francisco. I had briefly lived in San Francisco in, in 1984 or so. 
And Neil O'Dowd had a local newspaper, I think it was a weekly paper, maybe monthly, in San Francisco called The Irishman. And I did a few um, articles for that publication. And that was right around the time Neil O'Dowd was getting ready to make the move east to New York to start up the magazine. So I worked my way back to New York. I had lived in New York already. I worked my way back to New York to take part in the magazine from the from the very beginning. And I have to express my gratitude because um, it was a wonderful opportunity for me um, because they needed someone to, to do that work. It was a brand new st startup. And um, I was given assignments in, in all kinds of uh, endeavors, entertainment, sports, politics, crime, and they were all kind of from an I uh, articles researched and written from an Irish American perspective. I had some great assignments. I covered the mayor's race in Chicago one year for Irish America magazine. I covered the Barry McGuigan championship fight in Las Vegas. I was on the set of John Huston's very last movie, The Dead, did a piece on that for the magazine. So it was tremendous. You know, a lot of times when you're starting out in a writing career, a journalism career in particular, you get stuck writing for a publication, maybe, a, I don't know, a computer magazine or something. That's what would be uh, boring to me. You get stuck doing something boring because you need the clips and you need the experience. This was getting the clips and the experience writing from a point of view that was en endlessly fascinating to me. Um, so yeah, it was, and in fact, e even more specifically, I, I'm pretty sure either for the magazine or for the newspaper, The Irish Voice is when I first started to write about the Westies, which became my first book. Yes. Yeah, no, and 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 I, I had a similar experience. I mean, I'm coming out of a, a New York City Irish American background myself, but an emphasis on the American. We didn't, even though it was just my grandfather that came over, we didn't have as many ties to the old country, if you will. And and by getting involved with the Irish Voice, Irish America, I learned that's how I came to know a lot more about my roots in a way than than you know I, I knew the uh, this side of the Atlantic. That was how I got to know a lot of the other side, if you will. Yeah, well, that's so true, and 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 it was a great it was a great experience because. Not only are you uh, developing and honing your writing skills, you're connecting to something very vital and important to you, which is your own ethnic heritage. So I it was a great blessing. Let's get into this new book. Um, as you sort of hinted at, jazz, people don't think, when they think jazz these days, they're not thinking of crime, they're not thinking of violence, they're not thinking of things like that. You make that super clear, readers of this book we'll pick that up. I, I want to read a little bit from early in the book because I think it's worth putting out there. This is what you write early in the book. Jazz was an attempt to rearrange the molecular structure of the universe to obliterate recent history and replace it with expressions of joy, inventiveness, and grace. Then a couple of lines later, it is a quirk of history that around the same time that jazz was first taking shape, organized crime in America was also make the connection between organized crime and jazz. Right. Um, it, well, it is a it was a quirk of history in a sense. There was a long period of Sicilian immigration into New Orleans in the late 19th century and into the 20th century. And people think that the mafia started in New York and Chicago and, and in many ways it did, but it also, there also was a very important early mafia family in New Orleans, the Matranga family. And the Matranga family, like the mafia in other cities, um, was established in labor and politics in New Orleans and also in entertainment. They had what were called honky tonks and dance halls. Weren't, they weren't called nightclubs yet. And it just so happened that out of the plantations and out of the streets, and out of uh, Congo Square in New Orleans was, was coming the, root, uh, the roots of this music that we would eventually call jazz. And jazz was such a phenomenon in New Orleans and some other places where it was beginning, St. Louis, later in Chicago. Um, there was a kind of a, it kind of took the culture by storm. 
and Sicilian immigrants, because of their role as club owners, saw the value in bringing the music from the streets into the clubs and using the clubs as a way to present the music. And this began a relationship between the club owners and the African-American musicians, sons and daughters of slaves, um, a business relationship was formed that really would be at the center of jazz for the next 70 or 80 years. And um, a big chunk of the story, like you just say, uh, it starts in New Orleans, not the most, um, not, not the city people connect mostly with the, with the Irish. And you talked a lot, you, you write a lot about Storyville. And I guess to, to focus on one particularly, particularly important Irish person from New Orleans, uh, Thomas Charles Anderson, I believe his parents are Irish and Scottish, correct? Yes, yes. Why, why oh, well, he... yeah, Anderson was a classic uh, political boss of that era, late 19th century into the early 20th century. And New Orleans had a political structure that was quite similar to the other major cities of the East in the sense that it was run to a large degree by a political machine. And Tom Anderson was the leader of the political machine. And he became the impresario of a, the neighborhood of Storyville, which was kind of a vice district that was established in New Orleans. The, in, in the United States of America, back in the late 19th and early 20th century, as the cities were growing, there was a lot of vice, primarily gambling and prostitution, and music became a part of this. This is all tied up in the in the beginnings of jazz. And the thinking back then um, seems quite foreign now, but the thinking back then was, look, if there's going to be vice, let's centralize it. Let's create a vice district. Let's tax it, tax it. Let's make sure the city government gets their piece of the pie. And then we allow it to happen. Storyville was a legendary neighborhood in New Orleans where jazz and, and the mobster element kind of, jazz, the mobster element and the political element of the city all kind of came together. And again, this would become the template for the development of jazz in many different areas. Um, as you know, in the book, I sort of follow that thread to Kansas City and Chicago and New York and all these other places. And you see a very similar business dynamic uh, that helps to make the music flourish. And of course, where this is all put on steroids is during the prohibition era of the 1920s uh, when booze becomes illegal. And all of a sudden you have establishments, uh, underground establishments, illegal establishments known as speakeasies and other clubs that present the music. And, you just about any speakeasy in New York or any other big city that you went into in the 1920s, there was in the speakeasies usually a small jazz trio or, or a quartet or a quintet. And then in the clubs, the larger clubs like the Cotton Club and, and a, a club called the Plantation, you'd get large orchestras. Uh, orchestras like the Duke Ellington Orchestra with 30 or 40 members in the orchestra. And the only way it was possible to finance orchestras of that size was because of the illegal proceeds that were being generated by illegal booze. So all of a sudden, the presentation of the music and the illegal rackets that, that are sustaining the underworld all become kind of one in the same. We are talking to author T.J. English. We're talking about his new book, Dangerous Rhythms, Jazz, and the Underworld. My name is Tom Degnan for Irish American Magazine. Uh, T.J., one of the things I think that's great about this book is, is right now in America, we're, we're kind of undergoing a reckoning about power and privilege, and, and it's yeah. necessary, and, and it, we're understanding that certain people have been uh, disempowered, certain people have had tons of power, but, but one thing you walk away from your book getting is a sense that to some degree also this was, th this was a very sort of melting pot world. There were a lot of people sort of scraping at the bottom of the, of the social ladder, if you will. Even within there, there were clearly levels. But it's amazing to me how many people are, uh, of different backgrounds are involved in ultimately turning out this product. 
Yes, very true. I mean, in many ways, jazz was this great intermingling of the African American class and the immigrant class. So those early vice districts and the early clubs were Irish and Jewish and Italian and Sicilian and African American. And um, the larger white Anglo-Saxon white Anglo-Saxon Protestant establishment of the cities felt threatened by jazz music because jazz was the music of the people. It really was rising up from the streets into the clubs. You did not hear jazz in music academies or cultural institutions or universities. What you heard there was European classical music and jazz was seen as gutter music. And I have a feeling that's why people loved it so much because it was so authentic and from the streets. And it did bring together elements of American society that were hardly intermingling at all in American culture at the time. And jazz was one of the things that began a process of bringing people together. It was complicated. It was all tied up in race. Um, many people referred to it ultimately as a kind of plantation system because it was the white club owners and the white controllers of the labor owners of the record labels. Um, and the musicians were primarily African-American, but not all. Um, and so there was a racial dynamic to it um, that took a long time before it started. There, there started to be some economic fairness in jazz. Um, but yeah, it was definitely uh, a bringing together of strains within the culture, within American culture. That's why I think of jazz as such a, well, not just me, the, anyone who loves the music thinks of it as kind of the, the ultimate American art form. The, the, the true American art form is jazz. And looking at, as we move ahead into the, the sort of prohibition era you're talking about, I, you, you wrote the book, so your opinion is the only one that matters. But in terms of my reading of this book, if we had to pin down a most important Irish character, seems to me it's Oni Madden. Either way, he's very important. What role is he playing in all this? Yeah, Oni Madden was uh, born in Leeds, England, but his parents were, were immigrants from Ireland. And he came to Hell's Kitchen as a young, a young kid, about 10 or 11 years old. And he became the leader of a gang called the Gopher Gang, which is kind of a, a legendary and notorious gang in New York City criminal history. And he was a tough guy. And he rose up from that after doing a significant stint in prison to become one of the biggest uh, um, bootlegging bosses in, during the Prohibition era. And he becomes a power, economic power in New York City. He branches off from the illegal booze business into uh, other endeavors, sports. He owns pieces of a bunch of prize fighters. He owns pieces of a bunch of championship uh, horses, horse racing, and entertainment. He buys the Cotton Club um, from the boxer uh, Jack Johnson, I believe it was. And he opens the Cotton Club in Harlem 141st Street in Harlem, and, the, and he, he has a sense of grandiose entertainment as a big part of what he wants to do with the Cotton Club. So the Cotton Club becomes kind of the pinnacle of entertainment presentation, floor shows, a type of entertainment that would later become associated with Havana, Cuba, and Las Vegas, you know, the big floor shows scantily clad dancing girls, large orchestras, um, theatrical presentations. Cotton Club became famous for that. It, um, Madden was the one who sort of uh, was the impresario of that. And he was also wise enough to just hire the best people and then stay out of the way, which wasn't the case with some of the other gangsters like Dutch Schultz who tended to get involved in the presentation of the music. He even tried to get some musician, uh, a famous musician, Fats Waller, to, to sing a song that he wrote the lyrics for. But Madden was wise enough to let the professional musicians take care of it. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, Duke Ellington's orchestra was the house band at the Cotton Club. And that was some of the, some of the greatest music of that era 
was presented through uh, Oni Madden's club. And just to be clear, just so we don't all, don't all over romanticize this, the racial codes and the racial separations at the at the Cotton Club were strict, correct? Yeah, it was a Jim Crow club. Um, black people were not allowed in as patrons. They were they made up the bulk of the entertainment, and they also were the staff working there. You know what was kind of disturbing at those clubs, the Cotton Club, another one, the plant, Plantation. There were clubs called the Cotton Club or the Plantation in many different big cities, and they were all based on the uh, decor and aesthetic of the antebellum South. They were all um, built up around this notion of servitude down in the deep South. It was really odd. We look at it now, it's kind of disturbing, and it, it was disturbing. It was sort of an attempt through, jazz, through the presentation of jazz to hold on to in some kind of a nostalgic way to hold on to the idea of, of racial servitude from the South. This is one of the things that the musicians were up against. Um, they are forced to perform in these kind of clubs, um, racially segregated clubs. And it's one of the things that they ultimately did start to, to rebel against. And that whole Southern gentry mentality was separated from jazz, but it was there in, in the beginning decades of the music. And all of these undercurrents uh, are what make, it, it, that's what makes your book so fascinating that aside from this amazing music, we have all of these forces at play, some of them ugly, some of them uh, fascinating. One of the sort of gems in this book, it's, it's a little bit of a side note, but, but uh, you know, I always love a good Mad Dog Cole story. Uh, it seemed to me that he had a, was there a rumor or was there an actual uh, fact that he was going to kidnap Duke Ellington? I mean, what, uh, what, is, that, what is that story? Because that sounds fascinating to me. Well, for, uh, for people who maybe don't know, Mad, Mad Dog Call, who was from uh, Donegal, a family from Donegal, who became a, a gangster in New York. And really the wildest of the wild, right? He was the wildest of the wild. He actually probably had mental issues uh, that were, you know, undiagnosed, untreated. Um, he was crazy. And there's always uh, some way to use somebody who's crazy in the underworld who will do crazy things. And in the late 1920s, he kind of became a wild card and was taking on the different... Uh, cartels that controlled the booze business in New York. And he was kidnapping people. This was kind of a common racket of the era. You'd snatch somebody right off the street and then you'd make them pay a ransom before you would release them. And this became a common thing that Mad Dog Call was doing. And uh, yeah, there was a threat that he was gonna kidnap. He was taking on Oni Madden and that element of the underworld, which turned out to be a big mistake on his part. And he was kidnapping all kinds of people. And, you know, he set his sights on Duke Ellington because Duke Ellington was kind of royalty in the jazz and entertainment world in New York. And so uh, Ellington had bodyguards uh, with him at all times, which he didn't really like. And later on, Cab Calloway, another band leader, had bodyguards because they feared the, the idea that these guys would be kidnapped. And um, Cab Calloway wrote in his memoir that he feared the, the bodyguards as much as he did any, anybody who was out to kidnap him. Um, white guys with long trench coats and machine guns that they would carry underneath their trench coat, not the kind of people he normally would have wanted to be hanging out with. Mad Dog kidnaps Duke, call Netflix, it writes itself, right? Well, Mad Dog gets murdered in a famous rub out, you know, on 23rd, West 23rd Street in Manhattan. And the, the, the legend is he was, he was shot in a kind of a diner pharmacy and he was on the phone talking to Oni Madden at the time. And the theory is that Madden was deliberately holding him on the phone until the hitmen could get to the location and and Tommy gun him to death inside the photo um, phone booth. We have been talking to TJ English about his new book. We're gonna get a few more closing questions in, uh, but we're talking about dangerous rhythms, jazz and the underworld. 
Uh, TJ, I did want to ask some broader questions of you as well. Uh, first and foremost, I'm always curious about this. I suspect it's the Westies, but maybe I'm wrong. Of the books you've written, of the topics you've tackled, which one has had the most sort of active afterlife? The book is done, and yet you keep returning to the characters, the events. I mean, is that the Westies? You've also written about Whitey Bulger. That obviously keeps yeah. coming back as well. Which of your topics has the sort of most active afterlife? Well, the, the book was the biggest seller at the time, and it's had the most active afterlife is Havana Nocturne. Interesting. A book about, book about the era of the mafia in Havana, Cuba in the 1950s before the Cuban Revolution chased them out of there. Uh, that book, um, far and away, was the biggest seller. That was a got to number seven on the New York Times bestseller list. And it's being developed as a TV series for Apple TV. So that's kind of had the longest um, business life. The Westies has been fascinating though, because it's the first book I published. I was kind of a young kid, 30 years old when I started writing that book. And to me, that book was um, my process uh, among other things it was my process of becoming a new yorker not not being originally from new york um you, uh, you come to new york and I, you're uh, you're obsessed with reinventing yourself as a new yorker and uh, one of the first ways i did that really was through cab driving and uh i consider that to be a uh, a legitimate new york city um degree of higher learning um, driving a cab in the 1980s. And uh, I don't think I would have had the swagger to take on writing a book like the Westies if I had not had the cab, the cab driving period. Um, that book was such a, uh, connected in such a deep way with how New Yorkers of a certain era, the 1970s, which was a very tumultuous and uh, dangerous and dark era for the city of New York, uh, that anyone who grew up in a tight-knit New York City neighborhood during those years uh, was fascinated with a book like the Westies because it was really about trying to hold your community together at a time when everything was crumbling and falling apart and drugs were coming in in a big way and a level of violence was coming in that was sort of shocking and off the grid. I mean, you know, the Westies were known for dismembering their murder victims' bodies and making them disappear. And these were all guys, uh, the Westies were comprised of, of working class Irish American guys who were on the, on the surface of things not that different than people you and I would know from maybe having worked in a uh, on a labor job for a year or two or or you know it just to me that story was the extreme behavior of otherwise very kind of ordinary neighborhood people and I have found over the years that uh, New Yorkers are very touched by that book it gets at something particularly the male relationships in that book, in the neighborhood, at a time of extreme, uh, when the city was in an extreme state, um, it's, it's had a profound lasting value. It's never been out of print. Um, it was optioned as a movie from when, even before I published it based on the book proposal. And it's been under option ever since. Technically it's still in development as they say. I don't know if it'll ever happen. Um, but it's, uh, that, that book captured the imagination, I think, in a way that none of the others did. And to this day, whether it's a new sort of, uh, tapes emerge or someone dies or a, a, another, um, court case, I mean, you still read about guys with connections to, to all that. I mean, I mean, it's interesting that this is not ancient history. This is still coming up today. Right. Well, it all happened in our lifetime. And I, and I do, I do I remember that when the story of the Westies was playing out and I caught up with it as it was sort of coming apart at the seams and there was a major racketeering trial in the Southern District of New York, which I, which I attended uh, every day of, I had a strong sense that 
the story of the Westies was really the story of the ending of a certain type of Irish American culture that had existed in New York for about a hundred years. And that, I mean, in some ways you could say good riddance. It was, it's not exactly a proud tradition, but it is a tradition uh, of, of controlling certain aspects of organized crime within the neighborhoods of New York City. And for the Irish, the, the Westies represented the last of that. Uh, before I let you go, TJ, I should ask, fast forwarding uh, to sort of the modern day, the 21st century, um, another story we can't get away from is sort of the political divisions in the country. Social media has sort of developed in such a way, for better or worse, everyone's got not only an opinion. Yeah, it's very depressing, uh, the state, current state of affairs. And those of us who have are old enough to have watched the how how it's declined in a way, I think find it particularly depressing. I think a lot of it is brought on, has been brought on by uh, technological development so that now like whatever your politics are, you can kind of create a politically insulated world for yourself. You know, your own sources of information from the left or from the right so that you're never forced to think beyond whatever your basic, in some cases, your basic biases are. Um, and that's particularly frustrating and I don't know how we get out of it. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like, we're not, we're talking past each other. Uh, maybe it'll take a, a political leader that bridges that gap, but I'm not sure how that will happen because any time an attractive candidate comes along from one side or other of the political spectrum, they immediately are demonized by the other side. And so there's no real give and take. You know, one of the things of having grown up in a big family, there were a lot of political points of view. In fact, my father was a, a what they called a Reagan a Republican, and uh, my mother was a Democrat. And there were, there's a lot of political views right within my family. So you kind of grew up with the idea, of, yeah, there were a lot of arguments and discussions, but you grew up with the idea that we'll have our political differences, but at the end of the day, the things we have in common are, are far more important than the things that we disagree on. That attitude seems to have been lost, or at least it's become dormant in the United States of America. And I don't know how we get back from there. Maybe one of the ways is maybe if we all stop talking for a little bit and listen to a little bit of jazz, it would help. If a person <laughs> is if a person is relatively new to this art form, TJ, and like you say, people could be intimidated. It's sort of like an, a high art form now, so people may be like, I don't know, I'm intimidated. But what would what what do you think? Who's an artist or two you would recommend to maybe the jazz newcomer that might sort of turn them on quick? Well, first of all, I should mention that I created a playlist for this book and it's on Spotify and iTunes. It's 50 songs, it's three and a half hours long. It's sort of the music from jazz in the underworld, focusing on some of the characters that are prominently mentioned in the book, some of the different phases of this story. Uh, you could start there. And what you're gonna find out there is, you know, I start in New Orleans, start with Louis Armstrong. You start with Louis Armstrong. It all starts there. Not only the music, but this whole relationship between jazz and the underworld starts with Louis Armstrong. And follow it through the glory years, which is what we often re uh, refer to the 20s at the jazz age, it was called. So, you know, then you get Duke Ellington and a lot of the great bands that came out of the 1920s then follow it into the swing era. These are the orchestras where jazz is much more accessible and, and, and it becomes dance music. Some people might be drawn to that. And then there's the bebop era of the post-World War II years where jazz was played in uh, smoky basement clubs on 52nd Street in New York. And it was a style of jazz called bebop, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, and some of those musicians. Followed up into the modern era with Miles Davis and a different kind of sound that you start to hear in the 60s and in the 70s. Um, use the playlist as a guide. 
and it'll take you through a lot of the, the, the bigger names. And if you happen to be reading Dangerous Rhythms at the same time, and why wouldn't you be, um, you, can, you can play that music while you're reading the book and it really enhances the experience, I think. Sure, go ahead and bash technology and then use it to sell your book. Great job. Well, that's you. kind of the way it is, right? The good of and the course. bad. Do, do you have any idea what's next or are you just selling oh, this one first? Yeah, no. Uh, I, I long ago learned that the only way you make a living at this is to get right into the next uh, subject and make a deal with a publisher as quickly as you can. Yeah, I'm well into the next book. It's called The Last Kilo. It's a book about the cocaine era in Miami in the 1920s. I, I hope it'll be kind of the definitive book on the, the dawn of cocaine in the United States of America, the cultural impact that it had and the, and the business framework that sustained it and, and created it. Another stroll on the sunny side of the street. Yeah, well, um, that's, uh, as I tell people all the time, the subject of the criminal underworld is a endlessly fascinating subject to me. And it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. If you think of it both in a contemporary sense and a historical sense, it's, it's an inexhaustible topic. We have been talking to TJ English. He is a master of the organized crime book. His latest is Dangerous Rhythms, Jazz and the Underworld. Uh, TJ, thanks so much for joining us here on Irish American Magazine. Thanks, Tom. I appreciated the opportunity. Mm -hmm.